Sorry about that. I lost my signal. We are in the middle of uh, the Pacific Cas uh, the Pacific Northwest in the Cascade Mountains. We're actually in a little valley in the Cascades. So I apologize for losing my signal there, and I will continue. Hank Adams and another Indian in January of 1971 were checking the Nisqually fishing nets early one morning along the Nisqually River. While the other Indian walked along the riverbank, Hank fell asleep in the back of his car. Suddenly, the door was opened, and as Hank raised his head sleepily, a voice shouted, This will teach you, damn Indians. A rifle barrel came into view, and as Hank tried to clear his head, the rifle was fired point-blank at him. The bullet passed completely through his body and through the car door on the other side. Some white sportsmen had ambushed him. Hank was rushed <clears throat> to the hospital and after emergency surgery recovered. When he complained to the police about his near-fatal visitation from the two ambushers, the police called him a liar and demanded that he take a lie detector test. They accused him of shooting himself in order to get publicity. Hank refused to take a lie detector test unless he was allowed to have an outside witness present who could testify to the results of the test. He figured that the police would simply change the results of the test and tell the newspapers, most of which were writing anti indian stories, that Hank had shot himself. When the police learned that they would have to have an outside witness observe the test, they refused to give it. As far as can be determined, Hank Adams is the only Indian who has been ambushed by sportsmen because of the fishing rights struggle, but there have been other incidents nearly as disturbing. In 1973, the Washington National Guard, while on summer um, maneuvers at Fort Lewis, used the Nisqualis as their theoretical enemy, and war games were played that involved an invasion and extermination of the Nisqually tribe. When the Indians discovered that they were the subjects of the summer frolic, they protested to state officials who gave a very lame excuse about Indians being too sensitive. Later, the Disqualis discovered that the Department of Game was keeping files on their personal lives to determine how they could best control the Nisqualis. The fishing rights struggle will probably continue for the rest of the century or as long as the Indians have the strength to continue it. Considering that most of the tribes have been fishing for centuries in the same places they are fishing today, it seems unlikely that they will abandon their traditional life within the foreseeable future. The pity is that the odds are so heavily against the Indians. Whites, particularly sportsmen, blame the decline of fish on Indians. Whites, <clears throat> I'm sorry, um, and completely overlook the effects of the great power generating dams and the many heavy industries that pollute the rivers. Even the public doesn't seem to realize that there are so few Indians who actually do fish that even if they were to fish all day and night all year long, they would not make much impact on the total number of fish. In 1974, under the new decision of Judge Bolt, which allowed the Indians to catch their share of fish, state officials went out of their way to juggle the figures of fish catches in an effort to show that Indian fishing was destroying the catch. The catch of fish seemed to be greatly declining as a result of Indian fishing, and Governor Dan Evans asked President Ford to declare the salmon industry a major disaster area, apparently in an effort to gain favorable political image among sportsmen. Everyone was busy accusing the Indians of ruining the fishing industry until Mike Moyer, the director of planning for the Swinomish tribe, began to recite hard facts and figures about the 1974 catch. The total Indian catch in 1974 was up 5% from the previous year, but the total was still only 12% of the total number of fish caught in the state. So that's, um, again, from Vine Deloria Jr., Indians of the Pacific Northwest, which is a terrific book. I highly encourage you to pick it up and um, take a look at it. I think that you'll really enjoy that. So thank you again to... <clears throat> For joining us today. We are supported by the Indian Collective for this uh, Native Wellness Institute Native Power Hour and super excited to be here again. My name is Renee Romanose. I'm Southern Cheyenne uh, from Oklahoma and um, it's my privilege and my honor to be here today with you sharing with you some of the um, amazing books written by Native authors that you can pick up on Amazon or in your local used bookstore, wherever you can 
I know I ordered some books myself off Amazon this week. So, you know, look up those books. Hi, Cassandra. Hi, Rose. Thank you for joining us. And for those of you who uh, got dropped because I lost my signal, my apologies. I hope you've come back. And I wanted to talk to you a little bit about, I'm going to read to you from Recovering the Sacred. This book is by Winona LaDuke one of our um, powerful Native women leaders. I am teaching this term, Native American Women Leaders, for Eastern Oregon University. I teach within the Native American Studies minor. So if anyone is interested in taking online courses, um, Eastern Oregon University has one of the lowest tuition rates in the nation, and definitely in the state of Oregon. But years ago when I was at Eastern Oregon University. I returned there when I was 40 and decided, okay, someday I'm gonna be 45 with or without a degree. And I decided I wanted to be 45 with a degree. So I went back and finished my bachelor's and I was working with Jackie Grant for my uh, work study position. And I asked her if I could work on establishing the Native American Studies minor at Eastern Oregon University because it appeared that we had enough courses to offer that. So a long story short, I was able to uh, request and receive a letter of, um, of tribal resolution from the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation. The general council chairman at that time was John Barkley, who presented that resolution to Eastern Oregon University. I studied the Native American studies minors across the US and in Canada and determined that we were missing only four classes at Eastern to offer to offer such a minor and I then did a survey of native student or of all the students to see if there was interest in in such a minor and I surveyed the um, teaching staff and to determine if they were interested and I presented all that information to the president at that time of the college and he agreed to support it. So, hi Ruth Ann, thank you for joining us. Ruth Anna, nice to see you here, thank you. So, after presenting all that, it did have to go through academic channels and I partnered with Dr. Linda Jirofke, who's the chair of the Department of Anthropology at Eastern Oregon University, and she took it through the academic channels. She really did a lot of work and she now is the administrator for the Native American Studies minor at Eastern Oregon University. Uh, which did take four years to get approval, and it was with great joy that John Barkley, uh, former general counsel chairman of Umatilla, and myself were invited to Eastern Oregon University um, for the approval of that. I'm trying to get the trees to look a little, there we go. Okay, thank you for your patience. Really glad you're here. So the next, um, missive I'm going to read you is from Recovering the Sacred by Winona LaDuke. And so the reason I mentioned the Native Studies minor is because we are studying Winona LaDuke as one of our Native American women leaders. I offered that class at the request of one of my students and the students who are taking it this term, it's wonderful to see them step beyond not just the important historical figures, uh, Maria Tall Chief, Pocahontas Sacagawea, but also our contemporary Native leaders. So I really wanna um, thank you for this opportunity to share some of my favorite um, Native authors with you and to share the story of the establishment of the Native American Studies minor at Eastern Oregon University. Proof positive that we can make a difference if we're stubborn enough and heaven knows we are. So, on page 132, Winona LaDuke says, often when I speak to non-native groups, I ask audience members to raise their hands if they can name at least 10 distinct native nations in North America. Whether they are doctors of law, architects, or college students, it is rare that I find more than a handful worthy of the task. That is the amazing reality of a US education. While most of our children can name a set of superheroes into obscurity or a list of sports teams, presidents, designers, and fashion models, very few can name the native nations that have lived on this land for millennia, even those in their own local territory. When I have asked business people in the town 
that adjoins my reservation, if they could name 10 different native groups of native people, a few were unable to name even the indigenous nation in whose presence they lived, referring to them as the Indians. That is the sad truth. U.S. educational institutions have done a poor job in teaching North American history, particularly from the perspective of native people. Few know either about the history of genocide in this country or about the native origins of various dem democratic, medicinal, or agricultural foundations of modern U.S. culture. Even fewer know about the history of the treaty-making period. Outside of those areas near reservations, the American people are almost completely ignorant of the present-day struggles of Native people. By and large, most discussions regarding Native people continue to be framed in the past. The most commonly known names of Native nations are those popularized through Hollywood Westerns, the Comanche, the Navajo, the Sioux, the Cheyenne, the Crow, and so forth. Ask non-Native crowds to name famous Native women in history, and two will appear. Pocahontas and Sacagawea, those profiled most recently in Hollywood movies. Increasingly, when a discussion of Native people arises in a non-Native setting, the most common association is with a casino, again illustrating the rather limited knowledge about the majority of Native Americans today. Indeed, studies investigating children's perceptions of race and class in the media have found that most children in America view Native Americans as far removed from their own way of life. We are faced with a strange irony. The vast majority of Native images that have drifted into the U.S. psyche are those from the mass media. Television, movies, cartoons, commercial brands, and sports team mascots. In essence, indigenous peoples, as peoples in the present, have all but disappeared from the U.S. consciousness, and our vital role in North American history is grossly misunderstood. The false representation of the native and media augments America's persistent problem of historical memory and the related dilemma of historical revisionism. In the end, there is no victim, so there was no crime. So the native in the game, she goes on to write, they are the Fighting Whites, an intramural basketball team at the University, the University of Northern Colorado. The Reds, a nearby Eaton High School team, uses a Native American caricature for its logo and has, despite many requests, refused to change its name. Eaton School District Superintendent John Nusby has responded defensively to criticism saying, their interpretations are an insult to our patrons and blatantly inaccurate. Organized by both Native and non-Native students, the college group came up with the Fighting Whites logo and slogan to have a little satirical fun and to deliver a simple, sincere message about ethnic stereotyping. Their logo features a clean-cut white male in a business suit and the slogan, everything's gonna be all white. It's not meant to be vicious, it is meant to be humorous, explains Ryan White, a Mohawk team member. It puts people in our shoes, and then we can say, now you know how it is. And now you can make a judgment. With an outpouring of interest in their t-shirts, computer mouse pads, and other items, the Fighting Whites are putting their profits of their t-shirt sales towards scholarships for Native students. By 2003, the group had raised $100,000 for scholarships, an excellent response to the issue of Native mascots. A quarter century after Stanford University and Dartmouth College retired their Native American mascots, over 600 other educational institutions have joined them. In each case, the, the institutions have transferred their loyalties to a new mascot without, one can presume, huge psychological trauma. Nevertheless, at least 80 colleges and universities, hundreds of high schools, and a number of professional sports teams retain Native American mascots. While it would be unthinkable for sports fans to wave Torah scrolls or crucifixes, they frequently wave staffs decorated with feathers, peace pipes, or full feather headdresses, all of which are of great spiritual significance to Native people. Excuse me. I dropped my cup. I apologize for that. Thank you. <clears throat> It says, your religion is not as important as mine. 
explains Gary Browse from the Interfaith Council on Corporate Responsibility. From the grotesque smile of the Cleveland Indians logo to the video game Custer's Revenge, which featured a cartoon of General George Custer raping Native women, the imagery is clear and it is demeaning. The prevailing commercial use of Native stereotypes is as insulting and dangerous as were the minstrel shows that depicted blacks as lazy, smiling idiots. According to University of Kansas professor Cornell Peewewerdy, I apologize, I probably butchered that. In popular culture, using a person for your clown has always been one of the major ways to assert your dominance over a person or a group of people. Mockery becomes one of the more sophisticated forms of humiliation in sporting events. Therefore, clowning and buffoonery during ball games became one of the primary ways in which Indian mascots are used as clowns while sports fans manipulate and keep in place negative images during school related events. I was watching a news program today and they said that um, the football season was going to start in September and the fight against racism in sports continues, especially with the Washington team. Kate Stetson, an attorney who works on Native concerns, likens the mascot issue to a broader one. What mascots do is trivialize and demean individuals and erase a culture. The less you think people are like you, the more you feel that you can be violent toward them with impunity. That's the argument with pornography and violence against women. That violence continues. Even in the absence of violence, thank you for joining me, Lisa. Thank you, John and Myron and Weasel, appreciate you. And uh, thanks for checking in from Warm Springs. I love your land. I grew up on the other side of the mountain in Sandy and enjoyed many warm memories from Warm Springs. <clears throat> so back to our reading. Even in the absence of violence or insulting local teams, native peoples have an increasingly difficult time maintaining an authentic native identity in the era of MTV and the culture consuming elements of globalization. As mass media imagery from Disney and the like has percolated into the hearts of indigenous cultures, even isolated ones, and non-indigenous cultures alike, the struggle over Native American mascots and imagery has become increasingly urgent. And Leduc goes on to mention one of my personal heroes, someone I hope to meet someday. Uh, Charlene Teeters, a Spokane woman who has been a lightning rod for the present day mascot struggle. She equates the use of native mascots with imprisonment. These caricatures and stereotypes are really intended as prisons of image. Inside each desperately grinning Cleveland Indian and each stoic redskin brave or chief Illinois mascot, there is someone we know. If you look hard enough and don't panic, you begin to see the eyes and the hearts of these despised relatives of ours who have been forced to lock their spirits away from themselves and from us. I see our brothers and sisters, mothers and fathers captured and forced into images they did not devise, doing hard time for all of us. We can liberate them by understanding this and ourselves. So I'm glad that I can um, share that reading from Recovering the Sacred, written by Winona LaDuc, which is a very, um, she's a very powerful author, and I hope that you enjoyed that particular, um, that particular reading. So now we're going to, we're going to switch over to <clears throat> another Winona LaDuc book, with, written with Son, Sean Cruz, The Militarization of Indian Country. Thank you, Barbie, for joining us. I appreciate everyone who's tuned in today um, on your Saturday when you could just be relaxing. I hope that you're enjoying what we're doing today uh, here with Native Wellness Institute. It's my honor and privilege to be here. Again, my name is Renee Roman Nose, and I'm really happy to be here sharing some of my favorite authors my favorite native authors with you and their writings. And this uh, Native Wellness Power Hour is sponsored by the Indian Collective. Ogichida is an Ojibwe word that loosely translates as warrior, but the essence of the word is much deeper and more nuanced than the English. 
The word is perhaps better translated in the plural of Ogichidag, which means those who defend the people. Ogichida or Akasita is also a word shared between the Anishinaabeg and the Lakota, our most honored enemies. The great Lakota chief and holy man Sitting Bull described the meaning of a warrior by pointing to the inherent responsibility such a position held. For us, warriors are not what you think of as warriors. The warrior is not someone who fights because no one has the right to take another's life. The warrior, for us, is one who sacrifices himself for the good of others. His task is to take care of the elderly, the defenseless, those who cannot provide for themselves, and above all, the children, the future of humanity. Sitting Bull's definition stands in stark contrast to the stereotypes of Indian warriors as bloodthirsty killers, so prominent in American mythology. That is not to say that tribes did not engage in warfare. There are critical differences, however, between a war fought to defend the people and the land and a war fought to create or sustain an empire to impo impose colonial rule on an unwilling population. That is part of the ironic dichotomy in which we as indigenous peoples find ourselves today. There is also a critical difference between warfare designed to kill en masse and warfare designed to keep enemies at bay, as was the ancient custom of tribes. The greatest honor a warrior could achieve was to count coup on an enemy, touching his enemy without inflicting bodily harm. Such an act was a demonstration of bravery and skill as opposed to the demonstrations of immense force that are intrinsic to America's military prowess. The warriors of centuries past defended our people from other tribes and from the European colonizers. Our warriors worked in consultation with our spiritual leaders. Clan mothers sat in council to seek guidance in order to ensure engaging in warfare was essential to our survival. Many of our native communities have instructions on how to live a life of peace. <clears throat> the Haudenosaunee Great Law of Peace is one of the most notable examples of how our nations organized our societies to ensure peace was possible. The Haudenosaunee tell of the peacemaker, a messenger who came to the people and delivered a set of principles or laws for them to follow. The peacemaker came to the people with a message that human beings should cease abusing one another. He stated that humans are capable of reason, that through the power of reason all men desire peace, and it is necessary that people organize to ensure that peace will be possible among the people who walk about on the earth. That was the original word about laws. Laws were originally made to prevent the abuse of humans by other humans. These lessons should not be forgotten. Native Military Societies Since time immemorial and to the present day, indigenous peoples have created and maintained military or warrior societies to protect our land, people, traditions, and ways of life. These responsibilities were vital to the success and the survival of the tribe or nation, and thus warrior society members were highly regarded esteemed and often attained heroic status. Membership in these societies was traditionally voluntary and admission was usually earned through some accomplishment in an invitation from existing members. With the acceptance of a member into the society, songs, dances, and traditional knowledge and responsibilities were passed on from elders in the society to the new initiate. Some of the better known traditional military societies include the Cheyenne Fox Warriors or Kit Fox Society and the Lakota Dog Warriors or Dog Soldiers as they were more commonly known. Tribes often had multiple warrior societies, each with their unique traditions, songs, and ceremonies. The Mandan and Hidatsa were known to have 10 military societies. The Cheyenne and Kiowa had six societies and members of the Blackfoot Confederacy had seven military societies. Many tribal military societies keep memories alive and honor recent accomplishments through ceremonies and public events. For example, the Tongan Gi 
or Black Legging Society of the Kiowa on our historic and recent military deeds each October in Indian City, Oklahoma. They are represented at many important gatherings in the region where they erect their battle teepee. The teepee, it is said, originates from the Kiowa Principal Chief Dehosen and is painted on one side in black and yellow horizontal stripes that symbolize battles or achievements, mostly arising from their defense of their people against attacks from the U.S. Army. The other side depicts several historic events, beginning with the 1864 battle with Kit Carson and subsequent scenes from other U.S. military wars. Among the battles recorded are scenes from World Wars II and World War I, the Korean conflict, and the Vietnam War. Recent additions to the Kiowa battle teepee reflect the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and the names of fallen Kiowa soldiers. Native American military or warrior societies have taken prominent leadership roles in the past three decades in many conflicts over native lands and the rights of indigenous people. Perhaps the most widely known modern conflict was the defense of Wounded Knee on the Pine Ridge Reservation in 1973. Lakota elders and families, along with Native men and women from around the country, occupied the hamlet of Wounded Knee for 71 days to protest corruption and violence by the tribal government, ongoing poverty, and the violation of treaty rights. So as you can see, um, the books that I'm reading to you, uh, they're really important. They document our people and um, events that we have survived and been involved in, um, and they're from a Native perspective. They're from our perspective. That's why it's so vital that we not only support these authors by buying their books, but also share them with the people around us. So a little here's a, a little bit about Winona LaDuke for those of you who may not know. She's an internationally renowned activist working on issues of sustainable development, renewable energy, and food systems. She lives and works on the White Earth Reservation in Northern Minnesota and is two-time vice presidential candidate with Ralph Nader for the Green Party. As executive director of Honor the Earth, she works nationally and internationally on the issues of climate change, renewable energy, and environmental justice with indigenous communities. And in her own community, she is, she is founder of the White Earth Land Recovery Project, one of the largest reservation-based nonprofit organizations in the country and a leader in the issues of culturally based sustainable development strategies, renewable energy and food systems. In this work, she also continues national and international work to protect indigenous plants and heritage foods from patenting and genetic engineering. She's the author of five books, including Recovering the Sacred, All Our Relations, and a novel, Last Standing Woman. She is widely recognized for her work in environmental and human rights issues. Honor the Earth's mission is to create awareness and support for environmental issues and to develop needed financial and political resources for the survival for the survival of sustainable native communities. Honor the Earth develops these resources by using music, the arts, the media, and indigenous wisdom to ask people to recognize our joint dependency on the earth and be a voice for those not heard. You can visit www.honorearth Dot org for more information about that organization. And here's what the book looks like if you'd like to um, look for it in your local bookstore or, or on Amazon or Barnes and Noble or any other, um, any other. Oh, her name again is Winona LaDuke. Thank you for asking, Angela. So I can set it right there. Winona LaDuke. There you go. So <clears throat> there is a wonderful book that came out recently and it is uh, written by Tommy Orange. It's called There There. So have any of you heard of this book? Hi Terry, nice to see you. Thank you for checking in. Thank you for listening. So. Tommy Orange is a recent graduate from the Master of Fine Arts program at the Institute of American Indian Arts. He's a 2014 McDowell Fellow and a 2016 
Writing by Writers Fellow, and he's an enrolled member of the Cheyenne and Arapaho tribes of Oklahoma, my tribe. <laughs> he was born and raised in Oakland, California, and currently lives in Angels Camp, California. He is available for select speaking engagements. If you want to talk, uh, talk, find out about a possible appearance, you can contact Penguin Random House Speakers Bureau at speakers with a little at sign, Penguin Random House, or visit PRHS, PRH speakers.com. So this book was published by Penguin Random House and has done really well. So I wanted to um, share uh, a little bit of his writing with you. And this, um, you know, some of these readings, they can be kind of hard on us. They can, they can hurt our hearts and we have to, sometimes we have to put them down and we have to walk away because sometimes the pain within them is really difficult, but that's okay. Um, as my grandfather, Eugene Black Bear Sr. taught me, he said, granddaughter, if we don't remind them what they did, they will forget. So that's why it's important that our native authors write about these difficult things and that we read about them so we remember as well. So this is from There There, it's actually in the prologue. And I hope that you get a chance to pick this book up. Again, this is by Tommy Orange and it's called There There. Massacre as Prologue. Some of us grew up with stories about massacres, stories about what happened to our people not so long ago, how we came out of it. At Sand Creek, we heard it said that they mowed us down with their howitzers. Volunteer militia under Colonel John K Shivington came to kill us. We were mostly women, children, and elders. The men were away to hunt. They would told us to fly the American flag. We flew that and a white flag too. Surrender, the white flag waved. We stood under both flags as they came at us. They did more than kill us. They tore us up, mutilated us, broke our fingers to take off our rings, cut off our ears to take our silver, scalped us for our hair. We hid in the hollows of tree trunks, buried ourselves in sand by the river banks. That same sand ran red with blood. They tore unborn babies out of bellies, took what we intended to be. Our children before they were children, babies before they were babies. They ripped them out of our bellies. They broke soft baby heads against trees. Then they took our body parts as trophies and displayed them <clears throat> on a stage in downtown Denver. Colonel Shivington danced with dismembered parts of us in his hands with women's pubic hair. Drunk, he danced and the crowd gathered there before him was all the worse for cheering and laughing along with him. It was a celebration. Hard, fast, getting us to cities was supposed to be the final necessary step in our assimilation. Absorption, erasure, the completion of a 500 year old genocidal campaign. But the city made us new and we made it ours. We didn't get lost amid the sprawl of tall building the stream of anonymous masses, the ceaseless din of traffic. We found one another, started up Indian centers, brought out our families and powwows, our dances, our songs, our beadwork. We bought and rented homes, slept on the streets, under freeways. We went to school, joined the armed forces, populated Indian bars in the Fruit Vale in Oakland, in the Mission in San Francisco. We lived in boxcar villages in Richmond. We made art and we made babies and we made a way for our people to go back and forth between reservation and city. We did not move to cities to die. The sidewalks and streets, the concrete absorbed our heaviness. The glass, metal, rubber and wires, the speed, the hurtling masses, the city took us in. We were not urban Indians then. This was part of the Indian Relocation Act, which was part of the Indian termination policy which was and is exactly what it sounds like. Thank you, Charlotte, for tuning in. Miss and love you, my dear. I'm glad you're doing well. 
<clears throat> thank you for allowing me to greet you all as you, you come in. Thank you, Brian, for tuning in. Thank you, Teresa, tuning in from Alaska. Appreciate you being here. So, uh, the term, Indian termination policy was to make them look and act like us, become us, and so disappear. But it wasn't just like that. Plenty of us came by choice to start over, to make money, or for a new experience. Some of us came to cities to escape the reservation. We stayed after fighting in the Second World War, after Vietnam too. We stayed because the city sounds like a war and you can't leave a war once you've been. You can only keep it at bay, which is easier when you can see and hear it near you, that fast metal, that constant firing around you, cars up and down the streets and freeways like bullets. The quiet of the reservation, the side of the highway towns, rural communities, that kind of silence just makes the sound of your brain on fire that much more pronounced. Plenty of us are urban now. Lynette, thank you for watching from Massachusetts. I appreciate you being here. Hope you're enjoying it. Feel free to share this on your page. I encourage all of you to share uh, Native Wellness Power Hours on your page with your friends and family members. Let's stay uh, connected, my relatives. Let's stay connected. <clears throat> Plenty of us are urban now, if not because we live in cities, then because we live on the internet, inside the high rise of multiple browser windows. Thank you, Nancy. They used to call us sidewalk Indians, called us city-fied, superficial, inauthentic, cultureless refugees, apples. An apple is red on the outside and white on the inside, but what we are is what our ancestors did, how they survived. We are the memories we don't remember, which live in us, which we feel, which make us sing and dance and pray the way we do. Feelings from memories that flare and bloom unexpectedly in our lives like blood through a blanket from a wound made by a bullet fired by a man shooting us in the back for our hair, for our heads, for a bounty, or just to get rid of us. When they first came for us with their bullets, we didn't stop moving, even though the bullets moved twice as fast as the sound of our screams, and even when the heat and speed broke our skin, shattered our bones, skulls, pierced our hearts, we kept on, even we, when we saw the bullets send our bodies flailing through the air like flags, like the many flags and buildings that went up in place of everything we knew this land to be before. Sorry, mosquito. The bullets were premonitions, ghosts from dreams of a hard, fast future. The bullets moved on after moving through us, became the promise of what was to come. The speed and the killing, the hard, fast lines of borders and buildings, they took everything and ground it down to dust as fine as gunpowder. They fired their guns into the air in victory and strays flew out into the nothingness of histories, written wrong and meant to be forgotten. Stray bullets and consequences are landing on our unsuspecting bodies even now. Urbanity. Urban Indians were the generation born in the city. We've been moving for a long time, but the land moves with you like memory. An urban Indian belongs to the city and cities belong to the earth. Everything here is formed in relation to every other living and non-living thing from the earth. All our relations. The process that brings anything to its current form, chemical, synthetic, technological, or otherwise, doesn't make the product <clears throat> not a product of the living earth. Buildings, freeways, cars, are these not of the earth? Were they shipped in from Mars, the moon? Is it because they're processed, manufactured, or that we handle them? Are we so different? Were we at one time not something entirely else? Homo sapiens, single-celled organisms, space dust, unidentifiable pre-bang quantum theory. Cities form in the same way as galaxies. In urban Indians fell at home walking in the shadow of a downtown building. We came to know the downtown Oakland skyline better than we did any sacred mountain range. The redwoods in the Oakland hills better than any deep wild forest. We know the sound of the freeway better than we do rivers, the howl of distant trains better than wolf howls. We know the smell of gas and freshly wet concrete and burned rubber better than we do the smell of sage or cedar or even fry bread, which isn't traditional. Like reservations aren't traditional, but nothing is original. Everything comes from something that came before, which was once nothing. Everything is new and doomed. 
We ride buses, trains, and cars across over and under um, concrete plains. Being Indian has never been about returning to the land. The land is everywhere and nowhere. So that's the reading from Tommy Orange, who wrote There There, which has been um, very popular and widely read and is doing very, very well. So I'm very proud of Tommy Orange, and of, I hope to read more books um, by him in the future. So again, I would like to thank Native Wellness Institute for instituting these Native um, Wellness Power Hours. I think they're very beneficial to our people as we struggle with the at-home, stay-at-home, um, save lives efforts. Uh, creator made me stay home. Uh, three months ago, I fell and I tore all three muscles which make your hamstring. And so I was incapacitated for quite some time. I guess Creator was tired of me hopping around. And and uh, as I used to tell my mom, who's passed now, but I used to tell her I was her wandering child. And I was merely, that's what she called me. And I said, really, Mom, I'm just honoring my nomadic ancestors. And so I miss my mom. And I know many of us have lost a lot of people, but you know, we'll, we'll meet our relatives again. And we have to take care of our elders now. And again, making sure that they're okay, checking on them. Feel free to check on me. I'm an elder now. I don't know when that happened. It just snuck up on me, but I'm grateful. I'm grateful to be an elder. I'm grateful to have children and grandchildren I'm grateful for my friends and family, and I'm grateful for each of you for taking time to spend um, some time with me today with the Native Wellness Power Hour. Again, this one particular Power Hour is sponsored by the Indian Collective. Thank you very much for that. I appreciate you. My hands go up to you. And thank you for your kind comments. I appreciate all of your you taking time out of your busy lives to share with us at the, at the Native Wellness Institute. And we look forward to coming to your communities when it's safe to do so. But until then, we will continue to do these um, Native Wellness Power Hours. Be sure and check in in the evenings because we have Power Hours then too. So, Guno uh, Chish, Jean Tagaban, I appreciate you being here. And aho to all of you. And my thanks, my hands go up to you. And I thank you for your time and for your prayers. Remember to pray for yourself. Sometimes we forget to pray for ourselves. So I would keep all of you in my prayers daily and I hope that your family stay safe and um, healthy. And um, please continue to stay home and save lives. If you go out, wear a mask. I don't care if other people aren't wearing a mask. This grandma is saying, wear your mask when you're out in public. Protect yourselves. Okay, Terry, that's hilarious. Uh, Terry Wallace just said, that's funny, my parents called me the Renegade. Awesome, so tomorrow we have prayer songs from many nations and I hope that you can tune in and uh, even if you um, are busy, then catch it later and share it on your page with your friends and family. Thank you everyone, aho, from my home to yours, from the beautiful Northern Cascades to wherever you are, I hope that you're, you stay safe and stay healthy. I'll see you again.